on the uh, discussions that we started uh, about uh, the prayers of Prahlad Maharaj. So we had, uh, so uh, we had started off the discussion with saying that we will talk about the ten important points that uh, uh, we can understand from the prayers of Prahlad Maharaj. And since there is some new, so I just wanted to see that everybody knows about the past time of Prahlad Maharaj, Hirna Kashipu and Prahlad Maharaj. You know about the past time of Hirna Kashipu and Prahlad. Yeah, you know that. Uh, so, so we won't go into the, so we won't go into the particular past time, but we know that after uh, uh, Lord Narsinghadev killed uh, Hirna Kashipu, they were. Uh, uh, there were very beautiful prayers that were recited by uh, by Pranab Maharaj. And uh, the Vaishnava Acharyas, they spend a lot of time uh, looking at all the all the messages and the lessons, not only from his prayers, but also from the life of Pranab Maharaj. Uh, and so Pranab Maharaj is glorified as, as um, as, as the boy devotee, he was just a child of five years old, and yet he exemplified uh, the qualities of, uh, of such advanced Vaishnavas. So we'll start the discussions with uh, Mangalachar uh, prayers. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venama Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhistam Tapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeyam Shri Guru Shri Yudhapad Kamalam Shri Guru Vaishnamam Shri Rupam Chakrajatam Sahuna Ragunatam Vitam Sajeevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahuna Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitam Shri E Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpati Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namaste Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Rishabhano Sute Devi Namami Hari Pri Vansha Kalpata Rubaya Shetapa Sindhu Vyayavasha Patita Nam Bhavani Pyo Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gnanara Shvasari Gaur Bhakta With respect to uh, Prahlad Maharaj, one was that uh, when is a good time to take to Krishna consciousness? When is a good time to take to spirituality? And uh, we see Prahlad Maharaj, he took to the process even before he was born. He was hearing to the instructions of uh, uh, Narad Muni while in the womb of his mother, uh, Kayati. We also uh, uh, discuss that it is never too late to take. That there are great personalities, with Maharaj Kratvanga, who took to the process just one moment before he was about to leave his body. And he also perfected his life. So the right time is now. But it's never too early and it's never too late. So, uh, <coughs> The, the process of spirituality is, uh, uh, is so tenacious that once you take to it, there is never any loss. So whatever advancements that you make, you will continue from that point onwards. So even, even if you make a little bit of advancement, 
then in the next lifetime we begin from subsequent. That's why some many times we see, even in small small children, that right from the time that uh, even if the environment is not very conducive, that they are very uh, spiritually inclined. They have a lot of taste for topics relating to uh, uh, spiritual the taste for deity worship and uh, because of no apparent reason, not, not because their family is very favorable, not because they received any instructions, but they're just very naturally inclined to it. And the reason, of course, is that they're resuming their journey from the previous lifetime. We also talked about the power of association. That uh, Prahlad Maharaj, he had all reasons not to be a devotee. His father was a big demon, very powerful demon, Kashyapu. He was studying in a school where he was associating with the children of other demons. His teachers were given explicit instructions to train him in, uh, or as Hirna Kashyapu said, that protect him from uh, the devotees of Lord Vishnu. So uh, we are fortunate that we don't come with those instructions. Um, he had, his father had given those instructions to his uh, Gurukul teachers that make sure that he does not associate with devotees, make sure that he does not take to the process of spirituality. But yet, he was able to take to the process because he had received the instructions and association of Sripadnarabha. So that was the power of association. That uh, in the scripture it is said that even a moment's association with the devotee is actually much more potent than lifetimes of piety. And we can perform so much pious activities. We can give in charity, we can give in, uh, we can give food, we can give cows, we can give wealth, we can help the poor, we can help the sick and needy. And these are all pieties that will help us become more, become more situated in the more of uh, goodness. But a lifetime of that does not compare with a moment's association with a devotee because in the association of devotee, one begins to make spiritual advancements. And that is the, that is the ultimate, ultimate goal for which we can break the cycle of repeated birth. Because through piety, Prabhupada would say, piety gets us it's like he would give that example of people who have been incarcerated. And I don't know if it's there in this country, but in India they have, uh, depending on the nature of your crime, you have A, B, and C classes of prisons. <coughs> so class A prisons are, uh, they're, they're relatively comfortable. There's not that much overcrowding, and the people, uh, even though they're confined, but they live a relatively comfortable life compared to the C class where your uh, uh, where the, the situations the situations are really horrible. But regardless of whether it's A, B or C, you're incarcerated. Your freedom is restricted. You cannot do what you want. You're under the, under the uh, guidance and control of somebody else. So that's the nature of the material world. Whether you're rich or poor, whether you're healthy or weak, whether you're, uh, you're uh, relatively happy or unhappy, but uh, 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 but but the four the four defects of the material uh, uh, world of uh, birth, death, disease, and old age. These four uh, defects they are they are there with everybody, regardless of how rich the person is. The person also has to ultimately die, regardless of how powerful the person is. The person will fall will fall uh, sick. I was uh, watching one of the videos, later videos of uh, uh, Muhammad Ali, and it was really heartbreaking to see that you know he was uh, he was at one point the most feared fighter. People would not want to get into the ring with him, and then he had like Parkinson's disease or something like that, and he was barely able to stand up on his own. He became so weak; his tongue was uh, was uh, stuttering. He was not able to speak. And then I was thinking that, you know, this is, this is, you know, the person who was feared by 
people who are themselves very strong and he needs the help of other people uh, just to stand. So that's the nature of the, of the, uh, of the material world. So, <clears throat> so, this, so this power of association, we are able to make this distinction between what is really valuable and what is lasting and then make the, make the choice. Third point we had said was that Prahlad Maharaj, he demonstrated the, the smarana and the bhakti. So as you said, bhakti is performed through nine processes of devotional service. Shamana, Kirtana, Smarana, Pandana, Khadja, Sevan, Das, Pujan, Satika, and Atman, So these are the nine processes through which one performs bhakti. Shavan is through hearing, hearing of hearing of Krishna Katha as we are doing now, or hearing of Kirtan. Kirtan is the opposite of Shavan, which is speaking, speaking Krishna Katha, reciting Kirtan, reciting prayers. Uh, third is Smaran, which is what Pilar Maharaj perfected, which is meditating. That uh, Pilar Maharaj was uh, always uh, um, <coughs> one of the one of the Purpose Prabhupada says that even when he was uh, he was apparently in an adverse environment, he was not affected because in his mind he was always meditating on on, uh, on Krishna. And uh, I think Sachi Prabhu, you were sharing with me his meditation that uh, when uh, it was a nice uh, I had heard of it before, but it's very nice that uh, Prabhu was sharing that uh, <coughs> when Plaz Maharaj was being attacked. And he was putting, put, he was put through so many trials and tribulations. He was not actually able to see them as adversity because in his mind he was meditating on all of this in relationship with Krishna. Then when he was given the poison to drink, uh, he was saying, "Okay, this is the prasadam of uh, Anantasesh." And when he was dropped from a hill, then he was saying, "Okay, I'm, uh, I'm being welcomed by Mother Earth." Who's the who is a, a devotee of, uh, of Krishna. So in this way, everything that was happening to him, he was seeing it in conjunction with Krishna. And with that meditation, he was not able to, he was not able to see anything as, uh, as it was. That's why he had very, very little, uh, uh, he had very little sense of uh, bitterness towards his father. Because one would think that uh, even if a stranger is trying to kill you, you would develop some kind of uh, uh, negativity. In his case, his own father was trying to kill him. But uh, when uh, Lord Narsingadeva asked him for benediction, he said that, please forgive my father. So he had no, he had no sense of uh, bitterness towards his father because he never actually, he never actually saw anything as, as, as separate from and the fourth point was the implicit faith in Krishna's protection. So we see in the past time of Prahlad Maharaj that while all this is happening, he never he never asks for protection from Krishna. He never says that uh, uh, my father is beating me up, please protect me. Uh, these rakshasas are trying to pierce me with spears and swords, please protect me. One of the one of the popular uh, paintings of Plaz Maharaj is that he's standing, he's sitting there with his uh, eyes closed, his hands in, uh, in this mudra, and then there, there are all these kinds of rakshasas with uh, different uh, weapons, and they're trying to kill him. But uh, uh, in, in, in no situation do we ever see Prahlad Maharaj saying that Krishna protect me, Krishna protect me. Because he had this implicit sense of faith, like we see that in children, right? When children, when they are uh, they are in any anxiety, they naturally just assume that the that the parents will be there for them, and it's always it's, it's uh, uh, always there. Uh, you like you know, my son is 25 years old. As long as everything is okay, we never hear from him. His laptop is not working. He'll call up and say, "My laptop is not working." I will make it sound like it's my fault. Like my laptop's not working. Why is my laptop not working? So, in a way, it's a little, you know, that's the only time they think of you. But also, that's the nature of the relationship. They expect, they expect that, that you know, uh, it's not, uh, it's not selfishness. It's just, a, it's just a symptom of the implicit faith. They've grown up in their environment 
where uh, they expect uh, um, all children, not Indian children, all children. They grow up in that environment where they expect the parents to, to be there for them. So they don't really ask. You'll never see a kid saying that, uh, that, you know, I hope you'll be there for me if there's something that doesn't work out. Or very rarely they'll say thank you also. You know, you do something for them and that's what took you to so long. To do that. <laughs> they very rarely say that, you know, thank you very much for, for, for doing it. So, and of course, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to artificially employ that more towards Krishna. Prabhupada would say that um, it's okay to ask Krishna because we are, we are, uh, we are not perfected devotees. We don't have that, uh, we don't have that mood. The mood of children is that even if the parents don't do anything for them, they still love the parents. So the love is not predicated on that. That did you do, were you there for me when I, when I needed you? So there are two, there are two different interactions. And we don't have that implicit faith in Krishna now. We, hopefully we will have someday. But uh, one way of developing faith is by going to Krishna and uh, expecting uh, protection from him. Whether it is material or spiritual. So, um, of course, we try, we try to ask more for spiritual protection. That protect my bhakti, protect my advancements, protect my association with devotees. But, uh, um, one of the, in one of the purpose Srila Prabhupada makes this very powerful statement that, uh, that, unless, one is, uh, that unless one is able to, to uh, see everything in relationship to Krishna, one must make the distinction between material and spiritual. <coughs> so, Prajnana is able to see everything in relationship to Krishna, so he didn't have to make the distinction between material and spiritual. We are on that path. We want to see everything in relationship with Krishna, but but we we have uh, we have uh, uh, Prabhupada Maharaj says that you know we have two boxes. We have the Krishna box, and then we have the the, the my box. And in the my box is where we are looking from a more materialistic perspective. That uh, this is my money, this is my house, these are my hopes, these are my aspirations. This is how much. I have created, this is how much I have, uh, I have protected. And then there is the Krishna box, that um, um, chanting, serving devotees, serving the deities, and uh, uh, glorifying Krishna. So we are putting those things in the, in the Krishna box. And that is okay, that's how we all start. Eventually the Krishna box becomes bigger and bigger and the material box becomes smaller and ultimately there is only one box which is which is Krishna box. So we see in the prayers of Kunti Devi that uh, for everything she, she is asking uh, Krishna. And she is saying that uh, when my children were, were attacked in the Lakshadra, you were there to protect. When Bhima was poisoned, he you were there to protect. When the womb of Uttara was attacked by Shrathama, then you were there to protect. So these are all material trials and tribulations. Right? Everybody, I mean, we may not go through to that level of trials and tribulations, but everybody goes through material trials and tribulations. Everybody has some kinds of anxieties that are that are either inflicted by ourselves or by others. But everybody goes through some kinds of anxieties, and. Uh, uh, Kunti Devi, for, for all of them, she is thanking Krishna. And then uh, she is also thanking Krishna that somehow or else I have been able to maintain my, my, my attraction to you. And somehow, uh, in, in the midst of all this, my devotion to you has actually not, not diminished but grown. And then she is thanking Krishna for, for, uh, for that also. So, uh, so, we, so just like Lal Maharaj Kunti, these are these are advanced devotees. They are showing us by example. So we can work to 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 follow in that path. That we first create a Krishna box. Maybe it's a small box to to begin with. But then the process is is recursive, repeats itself, and then gradually the Krishna box will will uh, will, will take over our whole our lives. So. So these were the four points I made uh, in the, we discussed this in the last two discussions, 
And the next couple of points are actually about a very interesting aspect of uh, Lal Maharaj, which is preaching. Uh, before I go into that, I just want to stop and see if there's any uh, comments or uh, discussion. Okay, so yes, sorry. <clears throat> uh, so uh, distinction between. Um, material and spiritual life right and of course uh, we are not there true but still um, theoretically uh, one person still has to act right based on his condition and then mm -hmm. rely on Krishna completely for the result that's the understanding right Correct. because we cannot just say Krishna take care of this right, right. 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 thank you so, so yes so when we go into so when you go more into that mood, then, um, uh, and again, uh, Kunti Devi uh, personifies that. So everything that, that, uh, that, everything good that has happened in her life, she is saying, thank you, Krishna. Everything bad that has happened in her life, she is saying, it is because of my past mistakes that, 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 that has happened. In both the situations, she, you know, there is this uh, understanding that one should act. So one should not become a slave to destiny. The destiny is the material aspect, karma, right? I did good things, good things will happen to me. I did bad things, bad things will happen to me. So um, I'm just basically now a cog in the wheel of my own destiny that is driving me. So there's no point in me doing anything, right? So, so that is basically... Uh, 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 being uh, uh, materially misguided and especially misguided is by saying that uh, Krishna will take you. So why do I need to do it? Krishna is all powerful, Krishna is omnipotent, omniscient, uh, he can do everything. I'm sure he can take care of, take care of me. Sometimes people, uh, they leave their family and they say Krishna will take care of the family. Right? Uh, so, th so that is so, so that is uh, uh, spiritual immaturity. Uh, okay. So, uh, glory is that uh, we uh, we give our hundred percent, and then we rely on Krishna. If something good happens is Krishna's mercy. Something bad happens that we can we could have done better. Sajid, yeah. well, it's just a point of discussion. The Lord Maharaj was such an exalted devotee, so instead of all these adverse scenarios of bad association and all these things, he could carry on. In fact, he could preach others to bring into Krishna consciousness. But a practical purpose like uh, us or me, especially that we are not progress so much in Krishna consciousness. So uh, association impact our own way of progressing. Uh, and as a Christ life, we are bound to, we cannot avoid those bad associations. Some, somehow we have to get associated with them because of work, because of you know, household things, or somehow or other. Uh, so what should be the balance that we kind of ensure that you know, this bad association versus the good association is somehow the good association getting uh, you know, more uh, uh, weightage so that the bad association doesn't impact on, in our uh, overall progress. Mm. So, what what should be the, let's say, one or two guidance from your side that we should follow, mm. so to ensure that that doesn't happen. Mm. Mm. Thank you. That's a, that's a, a practical question. So, so Prabhupada would would, would talk about uh, that if two dogs are fighting, then the dog they defeat the most wins. So, so we have these two situations: a good and bad association. So the one that we take more is the one that will that, that will stay. And uh, we discussed briefly in Pradhan Maharaj's uh, aspect of association that we see him behave three ways in terms in the context of association, depending on the surrounding. That uh, when he was in the association of Narad Muni, who was more advanced than him. 
he was actively taking association. He was he was listening to what Nanda Muni. Of course, there was a practical situation. He was in the womb. There's not much he could do. But uh, uh, but his mood was, of course, all his senses were open. His his ears, his mind, and with rapt attention, he was listening to everything Nanda Muni was saying. So that was the mood of uh, uh, associating with more advanced devotees, taking association. When he was with less advanced but uh, a favorable person, then he was giving association. So when he was with uh, with his uh, uh, school friends, he was preaching, do this, do that, and he was preaching pretty strongly. If you look at the, some th some of the words that he says. Yeah, he's telling them, and these are all five-year-old children. He's telling them that you're all going to die, and what's the point in this life? That ultimately, and the body is made of of mucus and blood and bile, and it's actually a very abominable thing that you that you're attached to. So very strongly, he's, he's preaching. So then he's giving association, and then when he's with his father or with his teacher, then he's neutral. He's neither taking association nor giving association. So, so to a great extent, these are a guiding principles that when we are with devotees, we either give association or take association. When we are uh, in the in the other mode, then we do neither. We stay, we stay neutral. Now, from a practical perspective, uh, if you look at your uh, if you look at your life, if you remove the sleeping hours, you spend more time in non-devotee association, okay? and that also is more active association. Right. You know, you go in the morning and then pretty much you know, my work day is, is 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., 12 hours a day. That's five days a week, right? Devotee association is limited. It's Namahat or, uh, or through lectures, etc. So it, it's, just, uh, uh, it, it's, it's just a matter of being, uh, of, of being deliberate about it. Um, uh, Maharaj has asked this question a lot. And then um, he says that uh, uh, because he, he gives a lot of uh, lectures in corporate settings, etc. So one of the things in corporate environments is uh, taking breaks. The latest thing is that you should not work for more than 15 minutes or 30 minutes. It hasn't come in our work environment, unfortunately. But uh, 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 they say, you know, take a break after 15, 30 minutes, walk around, go to somebody's table, say hi. Don't work, and then go back. And apparently, that increases the productivity um, a lot. So, Maya says they take a special break. Work for 15, 20 minutes. Listen to a little bit of chanting. Maybe have some uh, shlokas. Read a little bit of uh, little bit of uh, uh, shlokas. Some workplaces where they where they allow, you can have screen savers like DTs or or uh, proper proper codes. Um, but the bottom line is that uh, uh, just like uh, anything that we have achieved in this life is because of deliberate planning. It does not happen accident. Like, you know, you got good marks because you studied for it and you became, uh, uh, you know, as parents, you try to be good parents. So you ask yourself, what does it take to be a good parent? Similarly, as devotees, it, it takes deliberate planning. And what does it mean to be to be a uh, making progress as a devotee. And then these are the kind of thoughtful questions that one can ask oneself and others to get, uh, get answered. Okay, anything else? One more thing I heard, Prabhuji, on the same lines of thought, you're giving uh, good examples. This is not in Krishna consciousness, but I attended another seminar. This was Brahm Kumaris. They have this concept of traffic control. Uh -huh. And their thing was, it's all about thoughts which are going on in your mind. So you did something good in the morning, even they do uh, their own meditation. Mm. But then in the work life, you are immersed with the now current thoughts. Mm. So now they have this concept of traffic control, wherein you have to control the thoughts in your mind. Mm. So every one minute in every one hour, mm. they meditate. Mm. And they have this app which plays this uh, one minute music at a random minute in one hour duration. And whatever you're doing, you're supposed to stop and then focus your mind on what you're, what's the right thing, in our case, Krishna. Correct. And then that's how you spend your day. 
Yeah, there seems to be a lot of focus now. There always was, but I see a lot of it now about uh, that um, if you're properly situated, then your productivity increases a lot, yeah. as opposed to just clocking in the hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for material reasons, but at least they're understanding the subtle aspects. So. Okay, so, so the fifth, uh, the fifth point, and we, we kind of had a little bit of uh, a discussion on this. Uh, so we see we see Prahlad Maharaj as an exemplary teacher. That's the main thing. That uh, as soon as and that's what God gets him into trouble. As soon as he can, he begins to preach. He begins to preach to his first. He preaches to his friends. He preaches to his father, and um, to those that he is not preaching by words, he preaches by action. So, but uh, he's always preaching. So I just want to, I want to hear from you. What are your thoughts? Uh, uh, why is it important? To preach? The fact that Plan Maharaj is doing it, he's doing it for our benefit because he's setting a role model for us. But uh, preaching, uh, at least in India, it has mixed connotation. Right. People who are uh, uh, preachers, they are considered sometimes they are like uh, what's the word demagogues. Right? They are basically uh, amassing huge number of followers, lot of wealth, and they just become power brokers, etc. Um, or mind control. They say you know these people trying to control the mind of others. So, so, um, so there is some amount of negative connotation. To, to preaching, Hinduism is the only religion in the world that doesn't preach. Yes. Uh, there is no pro, there is no active, uh, never has been. There is no active proselytizing. You never see one Hindu going to another person and uh, say that you know I want you to be a Hindu. It's not there in our DNA. You know, very. How many of you have taken a Bhagavad Gita to somebody and said that you know read the Bhagavad Gita, become a Hindu, yeah. and. Uh, Almost all of you must have, at some point or the other, been approached by a Muslim or a Christian with a Bible or a Quran, saying that you know, read the Quran, read the Bible. I remember when I was in Chicago, one of my friend's uh, mother, she came to me and she said, "Your life is going to hell." And I said, "I do not, but now that you have told me, I'm <laughs> interested in finding out how am I going to hell." And then, uh, I mean, she said it out of the blue. And then basically she said, the reason I'm going to hell is because I haven't accepted Jesus as a savior. And, um, you know, it, it really impacted me. I, I didn't take Christianity, of course, but it really impacted me that uh, uh, there is a, a possibility that I might go to hell. Uh, um, and uh, in our house also, we, we, we get now we don't get that many, and maybe there's some, some kind of system there. But we used to get people knocking at our house, uh, Jehovah's Witness and uh, some other, you know, very nice, very, very, uh, very presentable people who come and sit and talk to you. Have you ever seen a Hindu come and sit and talk to you? And it's not that it's not part of Hinduism, right? right? So I just want to hear from you, what do you think about the need for preaching? What was your question for The preaching, you know, the yeah. So you're talking about the past tense of Prahlad Maharaj and the fact that Prahlad Maharaj is, you know, one of the one of the first preachers that appears in the, not the first preacher, one of the prominent preachers that appears in the Bible. And that's one of the lessons that he gives us. But before I wanted to, before I discuss more about it, I wanted to hear your thoughts about preaching. Obviously it's to share the benefits of Krishna Conscious, but it actually can also help you develop more bhakti and clarify your own understanding mm -hmm. when you're trying to explain it to other people. Thank you. So, so yes, so it is said that uh, uh, when you preach to others, you preach to yourself. So so, so that is a that's powerful aspect of preaching. That uh, uh, if you go and say to somebody, uh, like uh, you should do exercise. Exercise is good for you. At the same time, you're also building the conviction in yourself. Exercise is good for you. Right? 
Now, you may not be able to like follow it fully, but still, it, it's a, it's a seed that takes place um, uh, in your heart, um, and uh, if you if you share sincerely, I mean, if somebody is completely hypocritical, it's different. But if you share sincerely, it's as effective on you as it's to the other person, because you know I go to you and I say you need to exercise, and you say what's the need to exercise? I'm you know I'm busy myself all day. So the doubts that you will express are the doubts that are there in my heart also. So when we have the discussion, then they're helping your doubts, but more importantly, they're helping my doubts also. And then the third person joins, eh? and then you know, and then maybe you know I say okay, that's a good question. Let me check on it. So the process is helping. It's, uh, Prabhupada would say that fish for yourself. And, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very potent in, in helping you. So thank you. What else? Prakrit? Like whenever, uh, whenever I say to someone, when somebody is in problem or see, I see they are breaking down, so I say, don't worry, have faith, have faith on Krishna. Mm -hmm. So I, I started realizing the more I say, have faith on Krishna, so I feel it in myself that I'm having such a big faith on him that mm -hmm. I'm confidently saying somebody to have faith on him. Mm -hmm. So it's my own perception. The more we say, the mm -hmm. belief and faith, it becomes mm -hmm. more stronger in us. Right, right. Yeah. right, it definitely works a lot in increasing the convictions. Uh, it's not, it's uh, my uh, perception. I don't know. So, uh, yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it definitely does work a lot. Uh, when you're, uh, so faith is one thing that that multiplies by being divided. So when you share your faith, it actually grows, right? Regardless of whether the other person takes to it or not, it, uh, uh, it grows, it grows. Thank you. What else? When walking the talk, the Okay, good, thank you, thank you. So uh, this again goes back to the point that if you're sincere about what you're preaching, then it will also help you, it will also help you put into practice what you're preaching. So you say to somebody else, uh, then like I say it to, then people come, I say, you know, try and do your spiritual activities in the morning. Morning is the best, best time. And then the more I say to the other three persons, the more I'm able to practice it myself also. Now it's not that I, I'm able to do it all the time, but the good part is when I'm not able to do it, I feel guilty about it. I think that, you know, I've told, like today I got up at uh, 8 o'clock and then I was like, you know, I tell everybody else, try to get up at 4 o'clock, finish your chanting, you know, by the time I finished my chanting and deity worship, it was actually noon uh, uh, today. And then, so, so at least that was, you know, I, I had that pinch in me that I tell everybody you should get up in the morning, do your chanting, do your reading in the morning, and I'm starting my deity worship at, uh, at 11 o'clock. Uh, so, um, it's a fine balance. You don't want to beat yourself up uh, about it, but it's things that you can use to build your own uh, muscles. Uh, so ah. Okay, Akshay Prabhu and Sachin. So uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu or Krishna's mercy is so powerful you know, that uh, really, f like myself, I feel so fortunate that I've received that f mercy from someone, somehow or the other. So, um, and I feel that that mercy is transforming um, myself from within, outside. Mm -hmm. I just feel that, going back to Madhuri's point, like sharing that same mercy, giving mm -hmm. that benefit to the other person too. And um, yes, and, and to add to that, uh, the nature of the mercy is that it grows when you share. In Mahaprabhu says, right, Jake Deko Jare Deko Tare Boro Krishna Upadesh. Right, he says that, you know, wherever, whoever you see, you give them the instructions about Krishna. And when Krishna gives instructions, then built into the instruction is empowerment and mercy also. So when you do what he says, even if you do it imperfectly, the fact that you're trying to do it makes Krishna more affectionate towards you. And that's one of the points that we see in Plan Maharaj, that uh, Plan Maharaj was doing so much stuff, and Hirnagashipu was trying to beat him up, and uh, Krishna was protecting him. 
but he was protecting him passively. Like he, he drank the poison, nothing happened to him. He, he was dropped from the ground, nothing happened to him. But there's no Krishna there. He's passively protecting. When uh, Lan Maharaj started preaching, then Hrinakashapu also became very anxious about it. And he said, now I have to kill him. So far he was like, let me correct him, let me chastise him, let me, initially it went from, initially it was humor, he laughed. When he heard the plan was going, he started laughing and saying, oh, what's this child doing? Then from humor, it became uh, parental concern. That this person is going to be ruling the kingdom after I am. Of course, he thought he was immortal, but still, he was he was thinking that he'll rule it. So he needs to be well trained in, in the materialist aspect. From when and all that was happening, when Prahlad Maharaj was not following the path that uh, Hindakashipu thought he should, when he started preaching, then he became envious of his son. And that time he said, "We need to, we need to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to kill him." And then he became fearful. That was the final stage. That, uh, if you remember, in the final stages of the interaction, Hindakashipu is not able to sleep very much like Kamsa, because he's like, uh, I'm immortal, I know I'm immortal. But how come there's another import, immortal being that has come into existence? And because he had taken all those benedictions. Uh, Pilar Maharaj had no benedictions. But Pilar Maharaj was unkillable. He tried every day to kill him, and he's unkillable. So he's like, I know I'm immortal, I know how I got this immortality. But this five-year-old boy, he didn't do anything, no austerity, nothing, and he's immortal. And then he said, maybe he is, uh, um, I'm paraphrasing a lot, but he said, maybe he is more immortal than I am. Maybe he will be the cause of my death. And before he becomes the cause of my death, let him kill, let me kill him. Right? So that was when Pilar Maharaj, when Sandhya Amar, his teachers came and said, he's acting now, he was he was a gone case to begin with, now he's contaminating the other children. Also. And that's when Krishna's direct protection. So when Prahlad Maharaj was preaching, then Hrinakashapu became really scared and then Krishna came as Lord Narasimha. Even then Krishna could have achieved anything, right? He could have he could have uh, figured out some other way to protect the Prahlad Maharaj. But uh, 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 that's why uh, when you're preaching, the first thing that you start off with is praise to Narasimha. Because Narasimha Dev is a protector of preachers. And uh, uh, you see so many pastimes and devotees that how they were in, in put in uh, so much of anxiety for some reason, and then they pray to not nursing a dev and nursing a dev somehow he appeared and, and, and protected. There was this lady, I, I don't remember the place, I guess she was in Germany or somewhere. She was teaching in a very, uh, she was distributing books in a very bad neighborhood. And uh, the general understanding was you leave it before it's dark. But she got just absorbed, she was devoted, and then it became dark. And, uh, uh, and she was she was walking back, and uh, the person was drug addict. And he had a knife in his hand, and he, you know, drug addicts, they don't care whether you're rich or poor, they just want whatever little money you have. So he basically came full intention to, to stab her. And then she just folded her hands and she started saying, nursing a day, nursing a day. And then she says from nowhere, like this big black dog came out and jumped at this person, bit the person, and the person dropped the knife, ran away, and the dog was disappeared. It's one of the more dramatic cases, but uh, the many cases you'll see this, this strong mood of uh, the dependence of the devotees on the nursing a day and nursing a Dev's uh, 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 reciprocation works. Because when you're preaching, you're putting yourself at risk for the pleasure of Krishna. So Krishna, Krishna really appreciates. Okay. Uh, I think both the points are got covered. So one thing is preaching for the pleasure of Krishna and for Guru, Guru's pleasure. And the second one is while preaching, the point that we make sometimes we have to like Prahlad Maharaj has faced ultimately his father's anger 
or similarly while we are preaching, some instances we may have that situation which is very adverse in preaching, but still we should continue uh, uh, taking the shelter of the Lord. So, so one of the points that comes out from this question okay. is when we are preaching, how do we stay within our adhika? Preaching should be based on experience. Sometimes we get carried away. And how do we not commit any offenses? It's a good point. It's actually a good segue to the point we're going to make. That from, from the past time of Plan Maharaj, we at least try and understand these three points. Uh, when to preach? who to preach and how to preach. So uh, preaching is practical uh, perspective. Chanting is, is, just, is just us, right? Even if our chanting is, is not perfect, you know, we, we, become, we get into some kind of anxiety. Preaching is a little different. You're either preaching to one person or a group of each person. So these three questions, when to preach, uh, who to preach and how to preach, they're important. So, when to preach? Um, the, uh, so, one way of looking at it is that all times are good for preaching, but uh, uh, it's good to preach in an environment that is conducive. Right? So because at the end of the 18th chapter, Krishna gives Arjun uh, two seemingly contradictory instructions. He says that uh, one who shares the sacred conversation of ours, no one is dearer to him. Basically he's making this point that uh, one who shares Bhagavad Gita with others. So he's encouraging Arjuna and others to preach. And then Krishna says, they should not be spoken to one who is not, uh, who is, uh, not a devotee. So he's saying, don't speak it to a devotee. Then if you put these two side by side, devotee already knows Bhagavad Gita. Right? What's the point? Then how do you, how do you, so to speak, expand the scope? How to go to a person, you know, like my friend's mother, she knew I did not know the Bible, but she came to me and said that you're going to help. Right? So she's basically looking at, at, at a person in her mind who is unaware of what's happening. So how do we how do we reconcile these two? And so that's where that's where the whole art of preaching lies. That you preach, but you do not preach. And between the two is the when, how, and 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 where. And because all of you, whether you realize it or not, are preachers, I just want to hear from uh, from you. What are your thoughts about this when, where, and how? little related to what we are talking about is thinking, is there something called as a passive preaching, where you are not actively going and saying people to do something, mm -hmm. but then what you are following and you just follow it and then maybe you know you express it to others that this is what we are doing and mm -hmm. this is like a simple thing is observing Ekadashi pass. So if you have mm -hmm. something at work on Ekadashi, mm -hmm. people if you know there is a close group, they would know, okay, this person observes Ekadashi, so they would not want to come for a no. lunch hour no. or anything. Right. Right. You know, so even though you are not directly telling them to do something, yeah. but yeah. you are following your own thing, so does that count as preaching? Like, is this like a passive yeah. preaching? Yeah. Or yeah. 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 Well, it's, it's one of the most powerful ways to preach. So, so Prabhupada would say this preaching by example. Um, but I think it's Bhakti Vinod Thakur who says that one should preach 24 hours a day and once in a while one should speak. So um, people are more influenced by what they see than what they hear. And I'll take this one step further that uh, not only by by, you know, by actually seeing you following like Kadashi or being a vegetarian. More than that, when they see that you are not disturbed by things that disturb other people. That, because at least uh, Sachi Prabhu will give, give this example that we are mostly associating with other people. And there, there is always so many anxiety. There are deadlines, there are 
there are power plays, there's politics, there's, you know, it's just the usual material world. And then everybody is basically, without realizing it, they're caught into it. That, like, what's going to happen? Uh, uh, economy is going south. Um, so many things are happening. Um, but when they see that, you, that uh, uh, you're not disturbed by it, you know, then either they'll ask you what's your secret sauce, or they will observe you more, more closely. Uh, there. So that is, so, so that is that is actually one of the most potent forms of preaching, because, uh, and again, I'm quoting Bhakti Mohan that uh, uh, if another person has just become favorably inclined to a devotee, his spiritual life has already begun. So they just they, they just look. They just look at Shivani and say that Shivani doesn't seem to be so much upset about things that are happening and they think positive thoughts about you. That itself is the beginning of the spiritual life. Right? Because Krishna is very affectionate to his devotees and is more affectionate towards people who are favorable to his devotees. So Krishna looks at me and says, oh, he's being nice to my devotee, so let me make arrangements for, for, uh, for, uh, for him also. And then it also uh, it also emphasizes the other aspect of it that uh, uh, we cannot export what we don't have. Right? So we can't teach unless we practice. So uh, now it does not mean so you preach according to the level of your realizations, but you can also preach to the level of your aspirations. Right? So they're two different things, right? So let's assume, you know, I'm I'm a struggling devotee. I want to chant good rounds. So when I when I go to Varsha and say, Varsha, you need to chant good rounds, that doesn't mean that I'm chanting good rounds. Probably she's chanting better rounds than I am, but that's my sincere aspiration. That I want to chant. I want to chant good rounds. So that is genuine teaching. Now if I'm not chanting at all and I'm saying you should chant good rounds, that's that, that that's uh, hypocritical. But we also chant to the level of our uh, our inspiration. That as we practice spirituality, then the nature of the practice is that it gives us many realizations. The question Parishit is asking, uh, Rajneesh Prabhu is asking. You know, we are we are how do we how do we manage associations? Right? These are all the realizations that can only come when one is a practicing devotee. Right? So we can preach to that level. We can teach to devotees to that level also that uh, uh, yes, you know, uh, it's uh, it's good to actively seek out the association of devotees. It's good to try and uh, use the filler time. I think that's the term terminology that they use. The filler time uh, from a spiritual perspective. So you can do both. Any other thoughts? So, so one other thing in preaching is that, uh, that ultimately the preaching is a service to the other person. It is not about defeating the other person. It's not about uh, increasing. Uh, what's the word that they say? Increasing your party strength. That I, I want more people in my party. So, so I I do. It's ultimately a service to the other person. So when you approach it in that way then naturally you'll be inclined to see what is the best way to serve the other person. Some people, um, the, I, I can share some of the mistakes that we did earlier on. I remember once my cousin came to visit us, and uh, very close to me, and we were very new into Krishna consciousness. We were like very excited that whoever came, we would say, take to Krishna consciousness. So then she came, and, uh, uh, and her husband came, and then my wife and I, we sat them out on the chair, we surrounded them and for one hour non-stop, we said that, you know, very similar to what, you know, we said you're going to hell, you know, you should, uh, you know. So they're, uh, they're Bengali, so they are into, you know, so the husband at least, he's into a lot of uh, eating fish, etc. I said, you know, I told him, you become a fish in your next life, you know, so, <laughs> so uh, they, they, they left our house very, very upset. <laughs> you know, to the point that 
uh, it's been what 20 years they still don't talk to us. You know, it was a it was a nice relationship that you know uh, let them go. And there are other cases where people came and they, we didn't like when I went and lived at my brother's house, we didn't preach. He just observed us and then he liked what we were doing. And because he's older to me, he didn't like to accept the fact that he's following me. So then, you know, he called me one day and he said, I went to the temple on my own and, you know, but now he's following Ekadashi, he's chanting, not chanting 16 rounds, but he's chanting 4 rounds. But, uh, you know, but at least, you know, it, it was because um, they observed and then they saw that uh, it was something that was uh, uh, making us more peaceful. Uh, so, so, so preaching is, is very, very, uh, even though there are general guidelines, but it's very, very, uh, context sensitive, underlying principle always is that what can I do to increase the Krishna consciousness, the spirituality of the other person. In some cases it may be to leave the person alone, that's the best thing to do. Some cases it's been to be just uh, practice, practice completely uh, on your own, let the other person observe you. And some people of course, they, they're open, they're open to more, uh, more uh, uh, direct uh, uh, conversations. Um, one of the things that you should not do is that somebody comes to you in trouble and anxiety and then you say to the person that it's all your fault and uh, you know, it, uh, because you haven't surrendered to Krishna, you're, you're suffering. So what will that person go back thinking that, uh, you know, Krishna is a punishing God. He's a, you know, he's, he's a bad God. He's punishing me because of something that I don't even know I, 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 I did. So even if they take your spirituality, they will take, take it out of fear. Yeah, which is more of ignorance. Those kind of things don't uh, don't uh, uh, sustain. Um, uh, Rampur Maharaji always says that preaching should be done on a platform of friendship. That uh, when you're preaching, you should always think that uh, uh, how can I make this person my friend, and and then teach uh, teach on that. Then. Uh, um, how to preach, I think uh, uh, Shivani covered that to some extent, that the most prominent part of preaching is exemplary. Just by, just by setting in, setting an uh, example, the verbalization is more in terms of uh, question and answers. The person asks for clarification, person asks for, uh, for uh, more uh, uh, further details. That's where most of the verbalization uh, comes in. But uh, uh, really speaking, when you see uh, when you see the life of Srila Prabhupada, he came he came to the U.S. in 1965, and if you talk to some of his earlier disciples, um, and they have been practicing now for many years, so they can speak more openly you now. So, so they said we have no idea what he was speaking about, because Prabhupada had such a strong Bengali accent, and he spoke British English, and he spoke about a subject that they didn't know. So Prabhupada would say, and they would just sit and listen, they would say, you know, they would catch a few glimpses of here and there, but they didn't know what he was talking about uh, there. So he said, we didn't know what he was talking about, we didn't understand the subject that he was, he was, he was, uh, he was, he was speaking, because uh, this was the whole hippie generation. They were into, into divine light and, and uh, be high and happy, and Prabhupada was talking about a constitutional position, etc. So they had no idea about the, about the subject. But one thing that they knew was that he was very sincere about what he spoke. And that's what attracted him. They said, we could see that whatever Swamiji was saying, it meant a lot to him. So then we said, Let, let's try and understand a little bit more. It obviously means a lot to him. So that sincerity came through. So his firm, his own firm faith and conviction, that came. And really speaking, this is true in all environments, even in the material environments, that very, very, very rarely you will be able to, you will be able to argue a person into following your, your line of thought. What is recommended is that you inspire the person. You have an argument and you may win the argument, right? person says that, like my, my wife and I, we constantly have this argument about supplements. Like, you know, she, she buys all these supplements for calcium and vitamin and protein 
and then I keep sending her articles from Google which says that the supplements are doing you more harm than good and the supplements are useless. And the only way that she reacts to it is she buys even more supplements. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, there's you know, there's nothing it, you can't you can't convince anything by argument. Uh, uh, argument. There might be some way, but you know, I'm not able to figure it out now. So uh, even in general life, right, you, you argue with somebody, you may win an argument based on core facts. But are you going to win the person over? No. Yeah. Right? So you win the person through the heart, and, and that is that is basically by anchoring yourself in this conception that uh, this is a friend of mine. This is a this is a what's the term that Brett Frank would use? Uh, this is a this is a future friend of mine. He is a friend in waiting. He does not know it, but he's a friend of mine. And then approach it, approach from that. Okay, uh, any questions, comments? The whole seminar in uh, Gita Nagari recently was on uh, communi communicating and, and not committing violence while communicating, and that violence was double quoted that you can really push away a person through your communication, so you have to be very, very careful. And words are very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Words are powerful. Um, so the second point that we see in, in this uh, past time plan Maharaj, and again we discussed that before, it was in the answer of a question, that uh, um, uh, Krishna's affection towards the creatures. That we all, when we take to spirituality, one of the things that we want to do is to make spiritual advancements. And uh, we, we do different things. We follow the four regulated principles. We chant. We go to the temple. All those things are 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 uh, powerful propellants. But of all the things that we do, the most powerful is speech. Krishna, Krishna is very very affectionate to a person who is who is uh, preaching on it. We have. Prabhupada would say the preaching is declaring war on Maya. It's a battle, and Krishna immediately comes to your side. That you will never see Krishna's presence that strongly on your side at any other situation other than when you're preaching. You will actually, see, you'll actually feel uh, uh, some of the earlier disciples of Prabhupada when they share their experiences, then uh, you can see it from the, from the experiential perspective. That how they they, they felt Krishna's presence when they took so many risks on the behalf of the Guru Maharaj. And the, three, the famous case of three young couples in the 20s, they had been... Uh, so how long did they know about Krishna consciousness? Maybe five months, six months. There. And then they heard Prabhupada once saying that his Guru Maharaj wanted to start a preaching center in India. So he sent his sannyasi disciples and they failed. And the three couples, they got together and they said, uh, we have to somehow please uh, Swamiji. That time we used to call him Swamiji. So the six, uh, six people, three couples, no money, nothing. They went to, they went to London and they started, they started preaching. And look at the success that they got. At that time in England, the at, at that time in England, the you know who was God in England at the time? Beatles. Beatles were Beatles were God, and uh, it so happened that the Beatles asked to meet them. They said, "Oh, we heard you're chanting this new mantra there." And John Lennon said, "Can we meet you?" And I said, "Yeah, of course." And then John Lennon actually came and he recorded. One of the Beatles hits is uh, My Sweet Lord, the Hare Krishna Mahabharata. So they came and recorded. And then when you look at it, at that time, there were, there were singers who would have given their life to just meet the Beatles, let alone record with the, with the Beatles. And the six devotees, I mean, they're, you know, exalted Vaishnavas, but they're not very good singers. They're not, they're good singers, they're better than me, definitely. But not at that level where the Beatles are there, people who are aspiring to be with the, with the, with the Beatles. 
So there are so many such, such uh, uh, powerful in terms of talent, they never got a chance. But, but these, these, these six uh, uh, young, inexperienced uh, devotees, uh, they opened a temple. In no time, they opened a temple on Soho Street. It's still over there, the temple. In go to London. We went there this time, and uh, um, the wonderful vegetarian prasad uh, over there. So, uh, and they have all written their memoirs. Or most of them have written their memoirs, and they share this one thing that uh, we always got a sense that there was somebody's hand that was orchestrating things behind us. That, you know, we would be we would be sitting there, and somebody would come. And, you know, Niyamna Mataji was, was, was there, somebody came to her and said, that, are, you, are you Hare Krishna? And she said, yeah, I think I'm Hare Krishna. <laughs> and there is a person who wants to have a Krishna a deity and he wants to give it away, a Krishna statue and he wants to give it away. She said, okay. So they went to it and there was an Indian merchant and he had a, got a Krishna a statue from Jaipur, but in transit the statue had cracked, the little finger had cracked. So, if the statue is cracked, you can't use it to worship. So he said it's useless to make things. Said, okay. They took this, they established in the temple. They asked Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, it's not the, it's not the optimal thing, but, but we established the deity and you worship. In Soha temple, there was other Krishna deities. And uh, in Bhakti Vedanta manner now, their Janmashmi is, you know, in our temple, Janmashmi is about five to 6,000 people. Bhakti Vedanta manner, it is one lakh people. For the Jamashtri uh, over there. Now it's come to a point that uh, there's, it's almost a rite of passage. Nobody who stands in an election does not go to the Bhakti Vedanta mm -hmm. because uh, it's become such an influential position. The Bhakti Vedanta manor was uh, this guy John Lennon's estate, he gave it as a donation. A huge estate, it's worth several millions of dollars, millions of pounds. He gave it in donation. So, so that sense of protection. Um, we can do it theoretically, but only when we experience it by, by, uh, by uh, practicing. Yeah. So the next point is, and I'll stop after that because I think I'm, uh, I think I'm over time. So um, the next point is that uh, the, the the protection that Krishna offers to to the devotees. Uh, that preach is uh, is complete. Prabhupada is, uh, uh, is is a living example of that. He was 70 years old when he came. He had two heart attacks. Uh, he had uh, he had 35 rupees in his pocket. He didn't even know that there were different currencies in the world. He just thought that everywhere rupees are there. So he came with 35 rupees, and he went back with the same 35 rupees. Because he couldn't spend it over years. right? So can you imagine if all of us at some point, um, well, some of you got married and came, but many of us we came on our own. I remember when I came to the to the U.S. on our own, so much planning going on before that. You know, I calling up my seniors saying that, okay, you are over there, just in case I need you, you'll be there, and okay, you are over there, and taking all the phone numbers, um, um, etc. And then you know, I was young, I was in my twenties at the time, but then also there is so much of fear. That how to prepare, how to prepare in the case of uh, adversity, and then you look at Rupa. He had 35 rupees. He had a trunk. In the trunk, he had copies of Bhagavatam. He had bad health, and then he came. And uh, uh, you never see, you see in his diary. The only anxiety that he has was that uh, he felt that he was not able to preach enough. That was the only anxiety. He, had. he never had anxiety that this is my my health is deteriorating, or this is happening. That was only anxiety that he shares in his diary, that he was not able to preach, uh, uh, preach enough. So, so, so that is one way for us to take to uh, uh, to strengthen our uh, strengthen our own uh, spiritual practices is to attract the attract the protection of Krishna. And uh, an easy way to attract Krishna's protection is to preach, and uh, Preaching can, like we said, preaching can take many forms. You can uh, uh, you can go out on the street and distribute books. We used to do that earlier. We used to go to malls. 
and we used to distribute uh, Prabhupada's books, Bhagavad Gita's over there. And then it's amazing that people are so open about it. Earlier when I would do it, I would, you know, I would think that this person has come and they mostly would go to malls. This person has come and he was wanting to buy something and then we would stop him and say, have you heard about the Bhagavad Gita? Some people would say that, you know, not interested, but few people would stop. But I've never had an experience when anybody was negative, like, you know, it's it, it, it. Only one time I remember I was, there was an apartment in Germantown, we were distributing books that go to door, and the person opened up, and, you know, we talked to him, he said, you know, he took a book, he gave us $20, but then he called the cops. So then by the time we were knocking on the other door, the cops came. But the interesting thing is that even the cop was very, very polite, very respectful, saying that we understand you're doing a good thing, but did you see the notice passing sign out there? Did you see the no solicitation sign? Uh, you know, of course we say. The important thing in this situation is not to argue. So, yeah, we're sorry. Just take it with and, and go away. So uh, it's uh, it's something that it's something that. Uh, from both within and without. From within you will feel, you will feel that empowerment and then you will see Krishna's protection uh, around you. So. Um, so okay, I'll stop at this point. If there's any, uh, <coughs> if there's any further thoughts on this, we can have a discussion. Uh, um, as you say, that, is, that uh, the uh, preaching is, uh, I mean, uh, the benefit for us. So, Sometimes what happens when you, I mean, you, you, you talk about Krishna consciousness, like people who yeah. are not into Krishna consciousness, like, uh, they take it in a very good way. I mean, they don't say that, but you know, they don't follow it. So basically, um, uh, our I, intention is you know, that these people also can follow Krishna consciousness. So in, in that way, is it beneficial? It's beneficial. You know, like, even if they don't follow, there is no loss. The only thing is that uh, uh, we should not offend. Right? So we tell them, and it's up to them to follow or not follow. We should not get a situation where they become averse. To it. That's where the art of teaching comes. So we should not go to a person and say that you're condemned, you're, you know, your nonsense, you're uh, you're a demon. So. Uh, even, so earlier on, the person may have been neutral towards Krishna. I have nothing to do with Krishna. No good thoughts, no bad things. Now he has all negative things. So you have basically done the opposite of that. But other than that, there is no loss. Even the person doesn't take to it, at least he has heard, heard the word uh, Krishna. When Prabhupada was in Chennai, and then a, a Sanskrit scholar came to him, and he had Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita in his hand, and uh, uh, he, he, had, he had done a lot of work, he had highlighted all the verses and then he said in this verse, this Sanskrit word translates to this but you translated it to this. And then he went through it and Prabhupada sat quietly, for one hour he spoke, Prabhupada didn't say anything. And then he stopped and Prabhupada turned to his disciples and make sure he gets prasadam. So he went to prasadam. So the disciples, they were more like, Prabhupada, how could you sit? And they, he was criticizing your work and all that and you could just sat and said nothing. And then he said, did you listen to the number of times you said Krishna in the Vana? So that was Prabhupada's preaching. He didn't say that he's criticizing my, you know, whatever it is. That was Prabhupada's preaching. The God will say Krishna so much. Yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> since I started uh, coming to the Bhagavad I have a very close friend. She's like a sister, like figure to me. So, I promised her, Amrita Mataji, to bring her with me. Every time I request her, I, I don't have any intention. I just want her to come and experience the joy that we feel here. So I, today also I requested her. I said, we are going to Bengali family, so you will meet them. Let's go before I leave, because I'm planning to leave from here. So I said, before I leave Maryland, I wanted you to, because she's a lonely lady. She doesn't drive, that's why she doesn't go anywhere. So every time I, I ask her to come and join us, I see a very... Uh, strong resistance, like you know, I believe in Krishna. I believe every, she. She is very. I mean, she believes. She is a very good follower of Shiv Ji. So she today she said, 
I'm only the uh, she, in the college. She said I always do the uh, from I I um, follow Shivji so much, but I have respect for Krishna. I feel like it sounds like her words that she's scared that coming to our uh, sangha mm -hmm. might take something away from her life or force her to change. So why? Like then how we can treat people like them? Like or how we can. Uh, how we try to bring those people to come to our association. I really want to know so that I can have more ideas from you. I can help her to come and have those and that last actually, uh, Yeah, that, that actually is, uh, you know, it's one of the biggest challenges. That if somebody does not have faith anywhere, then it's easier to ask them to place faith over here. Somebody already has faith somewhere else, it becomes exponentially difficult to, to do that. If the person has sincere faith, then the easiest way is to align the two faiths. So, uh, what does Bhagavatam say about Lord Shiva? That uh, 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 Shambhu Vaishnava Param. That Lord Shiva is the greatest of the Vaishnavas. You know, when the glorification of Vaishnavas has been done, then Lord Shiva is always glorified as the greatest of the Vaishnavas. Of the four sampradayas, one of the sampradaya, so there are four Vaishnava sampradaya, the Brahma sampradaya, the Shri sampradaya, the Kumar sampradaya. One of the sampradayas is the Rudra sampradaya. That actually comes from Lord, Lord uh, uh, Shiva. <coughs> so there is, a, there is a large body of Vaishnavas who are followers of Lord Shiva. But they are Vaishnavas because they follow the mood of Lord Shiv. Lord Shiv worships Krishna, they follow that, they, they follow that, that mood. So it's just a matter of uh, dovetailing whatever they have. So it's not that they, you know, that they stop their worship of Shiva, but uh, they, they worship Shiva in the mood of Lord Shiva being a Vaishnava. So Shiv, Lord Shiva, and this is the mood of the Devas also, that uh, they will give you what you ask them for. So you go to Lord Shiva and you say, give me wealth, give me progeny, Lord Shiva will give you that. You go to Lord Shiva and say that, give me Krishna, Lord Shiva will give you that also. So uh, if she has so much faith in Lord Shiva, then she can worship to Lord Shiva. But, you know, but, give me Markande Rishi, right? he's a, he's, Markande Rishi is a great follower of Lord Shiva, great version his faith is to Lord, Lord, uh, Lord Shiva. Gargamuni. Gargamuni was the priest who uh, gave, did the Namkaran, you know, the name giving ceremony for Krishna and Bhagavan. So, very exalted person. Who is his Ishtadev? Lord Shiva. Right? You go to Vrindavan. Before entering Vrindavan, who did you obeisances to? Lord Shiva. Right? He's the, he's the four Shiva temples. They are, they are the protectors of the holy town. They, the suggestion is like I should not approach the end. That's why we like follow what the wishes for. Or you could align her. I mean, uh, you should not say that don't worship Lord Shiva, mm -hmm. but you can say that worship Lord Shiva in those and the spirit that Lord Shiva would like to be worshipped. That's much easier for you. because otherwise you are basically uh, so I don't know how old she is. Let's assume she is 60 years old, right? So what you're asking is that your life for 60 years, you have to throw it away, start something new now, right? So just from a, from just a material perspective, it's very difficult. You say that all my life I've done something, now you come to me and you say that this is not relevant, start something new. So the whole momentum that's been built, you're stopping it and you're turning it somewhere else. But if you dovetail it with Krishna, then the same momentum will take her to Krishna. The faith that she has with Lord Shiv will take her to the lotus feet of Krishna. Right? And this is not, uh, you know, this this is not applying tactics or anything like that. You know, this is the true desire of Lord Lord Shiva. When Lord Shiva was preaching to the sons of uh, uh, Daksha, and uh, he personally gave them, he said, "Now I'll give you a prayer that is for your eternal benefit." And they said, "Yes, please give us the prayer." 
and the prayer that he gives them is glorification of Lord Vishnu. Okay? So that is his that is his sincere mood. Okay? I was being curious about the reluctance which she shows at the time. So, uh, that is natural. Reluctance is natural. What is the other Can I make a comment here? Yeah, yeah sure. See, I, I myself was, uh, I mean, I worship Lord Shiva almost like before I came here, which was a major part of my life. And uh, one thing I would say, I never asked any material, I mean, I just out of bhakti I worship Lord Shiva. So that's what he channelized me, me here. Also, so after I took to Krishna Prabhupada, I wanted to the duties of Gaurita and all. So, and we, we like, you know, in all Hindu uh, houses, people who do not know the scriptures and all, we have all the demigods, the same. So, what uh, gradually I did was I gradually of uh, like uh, Kali and other uh, uh, deities, I mean, I, I uh, gradually, I mean, I put them into a, in a lower spot. And, uh, but uh, then finally, it was only uh, the Vaishnavas who was like, Shivji is the same. It so happened in 2017 when we were renovating our house and we had to move to Pooswell. Because of all these things, I packed up all the things. And right now, even after we moved back, I, I have only gone with that and just prayed to, I mean, deity. So it's gradually, and I, it, it was because of circumstances that happened. But uh, now it's it's totally channelized. I have just gone with that and the uh, Panchakutas and everything. So that's what it happened. Also, I would like to mention, uh, is she Bengali? She is Bengali. She is 50. Bengalis, Bengalis have one thing, you know, everything is fine, but why do you have to become a vegetarian? That, yeah. is, a, that is a big thing for them. Maybe that's that's a very no, even I, I tell she's you scared. What? Like if those things are taken away. I, my sister also. But the, the, I just, uh, I interrupt you once. Yes, yes, yes. So the important thing to understand there is that um, it's a very small thing to come between you and Krishna, both ways, either taking to it or giving it. So if somebody says that uh, I eat meat, and uh, so that means I can't be a Vaishnava. That's a wrong. One. That's you know you can straight away say that's not true, right? And if somebody says that I'm a vegetarian, so I'm a Vaishnava, that is not. True. The world is full of lot of demoniac vegetarian. So vegetarianism is conducive. It's it's something that helps. It helps your consciousness. The fact that you don't have to kill somebody to satisfy your desires of your tongue, you know. So it's conducive, and scripturally it is recommended. Right? But it's not an obstacle, one way or the other. So your friend says that, you know, I don't want to take to Vaishnava because those Hare Krishna says you have to become vegetarian. The answer is no. no. Take to Krishna consciousness, Krishna will make you vegetarian. Don't worry about that. Right? Yeah. I mean, you don't have to say that, but that's what happens. That people who take to Krishna consciousness, eventually, you know, I remember having this conversation with Balaka 10, 12 years ago. Buddha Dev was saying, you know, Buddha Dev came to a house and he came alone. I said, you know, are you single? He said, no, I have a wife. And I said, why don't you get her? So she, she is fish. <laughs> and I said, that's okay, you can get her. He said, no, 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 she is, Buddha Dev is very strict. He said, no, no, she is fish. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <clears throat> then, you know, and every time he would come, I said, no, get your wife, get your wife. And, you know, Balaka is chanting and, you know, and uh, taking, uh, worshipping Gornitai. So, Krishna will take care of that. Also, you know, my sister was also, so she, she was telling, and you Everything is fine where you have to become a vegetarian. That thing is not. I also worship everything. She has all sorts of. I don't know, because of some adversity or something, she, now she is like, because of Gaurgopal Prabhu, she is a big fan of Gaurgopal Prabhu. And like she is, I think, because I don't know, it's Krishna's way. Now she is also maybe channelizing towards Krishna consciousness. It's a very sweet mystery for me. Like when I see, uh, when I listen to those. Uh, like uh, transformations, so maybe I feel like my friend is hesitant of the transformation. She gets transformed. She is more attached to her own beliefs. So, but I think it's a spontaneous joy that it happens. It's just automatic. One of the essential components of preaching is detachment. You have to have that sense of detachment. She's too much attached to Shiva for now, of now, as of now. Yeah. So. No, even in you as a preacher, you have to have that detachment because 
you preach to 10 people, two people may take to it, eight people may not take to it. But they have to have the detachment. You do their best. Like I was saying last time, none of Prabhupada's children took to Krishna consciousness. He was able to make the world Krishna conscious. But his wife sold his Bhagavad Gita for biscuits. He had spent so many years translating the Bhagavad Gita and uh, uh, she, she, she just thought, I mean, she, she knew it was a translation. And in India they have these people, Radhivadas, they come. And she said, you know, how much will you give me for this paper? She said, I'll give you one pack of this. Paper. So, you know, you have to have the paper. Anything else? Thoughts? I just thought, uh, especially those early devotees. Can you call the children? Yeah. Because early devotees, the way they preached without understanding what Prabhupada, what philosophy is talking about, the conviction that you the point man. And the uh, mercy flow from as a guru, as a spiritual master, from Prabhupada, that probably make them successful, uh, probably going all over the world and teaching. Yeah. And I mean, just for example, when these three couples went, mm -hmm. they didn't have money to satisfy the immigration because when they went to travel, they have to show certain money in their account. So they actually transfer them also. One person travel, the money transfer to another account, another person travel. And then the money again transferred to the third account that the other person okay. So that's the way they moved to UK. I mean, that's the kind of conviction they had that this Swamiji is talking something which is much, much more valuable than all what we are doing in US. So I think that's another point, taking mercy, I mean, taking shelter of a guru and the mercy comes through, through that. That's has probably the most powerful thing. You should definitely aspire for that, take shelter of a guru. So we'll stop over here. Um, thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai.